In chapter 3 of his Gospel, Mark introduced the idea of a boat on the Lake of Galilee for Jesus to get into and escape from the crowds, but he took the idea no further. Here in chapter 4 he comes back to that idea. This time Jesus does get into the boat. There is a fairly elaborate chiastic structure to Mark, and one aspect of this involves the cycling of themes of crowds by the sea, sea crossings in boats, and healings. It spans several chapters, so I will not get into it here. Chapter 4, verse 1. Again he began to teach by the lake. Such a large crowd gathered around him that he got into a boat on the lake and sat there while the whole crowd was on the shore by the lake. He taught them many things in parables and in his teachings said to them, Listen, a sower went out to sow. And as he sowed, some seed fell on the path and the birds came and devoured it. Other seed fell on rocky ground where it did not have much soil. It sprang up at once because the soil was not deep. When the sun came up it was scorched, and because it did not have sufficient root, it withered. Other seed fell among the thorns, and they grew up and choked it, and it did not produce grain. But other seed fell on good soil and produced grain, sprouting and growing. Some yielded thirty times as much, some sixty, and some a hundred times. And he said, whoever has ears to hear had better listen. When he was alone, those around him with the twelve asked him about the parables. He said to them, The secret of the kingdom of God has been given to you, but to those outside everything is in parables, so that, although they look, they may look but not see, and although they hear, they may hear but not understand, so that they may not repent and be forgiven. That's a quote from Isaiah 6. It's an odd explanation. The secret of God has been given to you, but to those outside everything is in parables. Really? Is everything in the whole Gospel of Mark in parables? Is Mark telling us here that Jesus never existed and that the whole story is a parable? And there is this quote from Isaiah, which by the standards of the New Testament is unusually accurate, though he substitutes forgiven for the original healed, possibly because he was copying from a targum that uses forgiven that is still extant. A targum being an Aramaic paraphrase of the Hebrew Bible used in synagogues around the first century AD. But he goes on to explain the parable of the sower. He said to them, don't you understand this parable? Then how will you understand any parable? The sower sows the word. These are the ones on the path where the word is sown. Whenever they hear, immediately Satan comes and snatches the word that was sown in them. These are the ones sown on rocky ground. As soon as they hear the word, they receive it with joy, but they have no root in themselves and do not endure. Then when trouble or persecution comes because of the word, immediately they fall away. Others are the ones sown among thorns. They are those who hear the word, but worldly cares, the seductiveness of wealth and the desire for other things come in and choke the word, and it produces nothing. But these are the ones sown on good soil. They hear the word and receive it and bear fruit one thirty times as much, one sixty, and one a hundred. So the first part of the explanation of this parable, the part that quotes Isaiah 6, 9 to 10, and implies that the gospel is given to an inner circle and concealed from those outside that circle by speaking in parables. That part of it is problematic for Christians because it suggests that not everybody is welcome in the church. However, the next part of the explanation, which is after all about the same parable, could hardly be clearer in stating that the insiders are not chosen because they are favoured for some reason, but rather they are self-selecting. They hear the gospel and choose to take it seriously. It's not a decision that Jesus or God makes. It's a decision that you make. It seems to me that this is a pretty clear import from this section of Mark. Christian detractors who use verses 10 to 12 to argue for a hidden message for an inner circle do so by taking it out of context, showing incidentally that Christians do not have a monopoly on that practice. Following that, you get the impression of a slight return to flight of ideas for a few verses before Jesus gets back to his agricultural theme. Verse 21, he also said to them, a lamp isn't brought to be put under a basket or under a bed, is it? Isn't it to be placed on a lampstand? For nothing is hidden except to be revealed, and nothing concealed except to be brought to light. If anyone has ears to hear, he'd better listen. And he said to them, Take care about what you hear. 
The measure you use will be the measure you receive, and more will be added to you. For whoever has will be given more, but whoever does not have, even what he has will be taken from him. Then in verse 26, he's back to agricultural parables. He also said, The kingdom of God is like someone who spreads seed on the ground. He goes to sleep and gets up night and day, and the seed sprouts and grows, though he does not know how. By itself, the soil produces a crop, first the stalk, then the head, then the full grain in the head. And then when the grain is ripe, he sends in the sickle because the harvest has come. He also asked, to what can we compare the kingdom of God, or what parable can we use to present it? It is like a mustard seed that when sown in the ground, even though it is the smallest of all the seeds in the ground when it is sown, it grows up, becomes the greatest of all garden plants, and grows large branches so that all the wild birds can nest in its shade. So with many parables like these, he spoke the word to them and they were able to hear. He did not speak to them without a parable, but privately he explained everything to his own disciples. And this tends to return to an element of secrecy. What you've heard transmitted to the masses is not the truth. There is an esoteric knowledge that comes to you via a true apostolic lineage. Then finally, at the end of chapter 4, we get to one of the points of these boating hints. The boating theme was introduced in order to demonstrate that Jesus can control the weather. Verse 35. On that day when evening came, Jesus said to his disciples, Let's go across to the other side of the lake. So after leaving the crowd, they took him along just as he was in the boat, and other boats were with him. Now a great windstorm developed, and the waves were breaking into the boat, so that the boat was nearly swamped. But he was in the stern, sleeping on a cushion. They woke him up and said to him, Teacher, don't you care that we are about to die? So he got up and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, Be quiet, calm down. Then the wind stopped and it was dead calm. And he said to them, Why are you cowardly? Do you still not have faith? And they were overwhelmed by fear and said to one another, Who is this? Even the wind and sea obey him. So this chapter is not very historicising. It has three sowing parables, a few sayings and a watery miracle, but there are no geographical or temporal details other than those required to set up the stories. That's not much of an argument, particularly when it's applied to just one chapter, but it is something to look out for. The fewer odd details that Mark mentions that do not appear to advance his theological agenda, the less historicising it is and the stronger the argument against Jesus' existence. 